Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in this episode? This episode, we are joined by three special guests, author Elise Hooper, here to talk about her new book, Fast Girls, and two professional athletes, Amber Ferreira and Rachel Jastrzewski, the fastest girls I know. We are going to talk about the remarkable first American women to race in track and field at the Olympics. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, The Other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 6, His Race, Her Race. Hello, everyone. Today, we are joined by three powerhouse women. Elise Hooper, author of Fast Girls, joins us today from Washington State to discuss her books and the lives of the first female Olympians to race. After discussing her book in a portion of women's athletic history, we will turn our discussion to Amber Ferreira and Rachel Dostrebski, both professional triathletes. Amber Ferreira won Ironman Lake Placid and went on to represent the United States at the World Championships in Kona and then again at the 70.3 championships last year she was also notably my coach uh rachel is also a badass triathlete in 2018 she raced ironman lake placid for the third time less than a year after having a baby finished eighth and later found out she was pregnant with baby number two Despite the decades that separate Amber and Rachel from the characters in Elise's book, many barriers remain the same. Both Amber and Rachel have played a pivotal role in dismantling the patriarchal structure of Iron Man and making a place for women in sport. Welcome, Elise, Amber, and Rachel. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> All right. We're going to first turn to Elise. Um, your book is the fourth that I've read about the athletes from the 1936 Olympics. I've seen a feature film and a documentary about these Olympics. And the only mention of women in those various books and documentaries and things that I've seen was um, the infamous exclusion of Gretel Bergman, Germany's uh, Jewish high jumper, who was excluded. And then Louis Zamperini in a documentary that I saw, um, he's a notorious jokester. And so he thought it was hilarious that in the opening ceremonies, the doves flew over the women's head and then they shot cannons off, and so all the doves pooped onto the women's heads. Um, and so those literally were the only two mentions of women that I've ever heard about at the Olympics, and I probably should have investigated further, and thank goodness that your book came uh, into my hands. <laughs> so reading your book for me was the classic, how have I never heard of these women, you know, given that I've read a lot on this. And so we're excited to have you here because you are also a former teacher and in our podcast we always start every episode with an explanation for why women have been left out of history and i'm just curious what your you know in your experience as an author and a teacher what do you see as the biggest barrier to getting women's experiences into history class right well i mean i think a big part of the problem is that Anyone who's historically been excluded from power, be that people of color, white people, uh, uh, women, um, not white people, but women, um, you know, you are just, you're kind of erased from history in the sense that you, um, you know, you couldn't own property, you couldn't have bank accounts, like really there's very little historical record, right, of your existence. And so I think that women are often not included. Um, and same thing with like people of color because they didn't, weren't allowed to do like, do some of these, what we consider basic things, go to school, um, own property, all the things that there could be records for. So I think when history took a very sort of narrow view over the decades of like who history was about, right? It was just sort of about the people who there were records of, like clearly women were going to be overlooked. But I think now um, we're seeing, you know, probably even since the seventies, but certainly in the last few years, a much greater interest in kind of widening that um, inclusion of who is in history classes. And I, I, I see teachers all the time 
working harder to move beyond just kind of like the founding fathers and like, you know, the presidents and blah, blah, blah. And, and now people are much more interested in activists and, um, and people who have been kind of, um, you know, hidden in the footnotes and end notes all these years. Oh, I love that idea of hidden in the footnotes. That's like, that's so true. Cause it's, there's always like this little like, but it, oh yeah, that person. <laughs> well, yeah. Kelsey and I talk about that all the time. Like you'll be reading the page and then it'll have like an excerpt, like, and he was married to this really famous woman, but she's over here. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Gosh. Well, so Elise, if you could pick one woman in history to get airtime in a history class, who would it be? Oh my gosh. I mean, I have so many. Gosh, who would it be? That's such a good question. Because, you know, there are some women who are included. Who would that be? One woman who's not included. Well, I mean, I actually think that a lot of these pioneering women athletes would really be interesting to students because so many students are interested in sports, can relate to sports. And I think that sports often serves as a really interesting mirror of kind of what's happening in a greater society, right? I mean, civil rights plays out in the sports arena. I think we, I think actually a, a unit on like on athletics over the years would really go a long way for helping students understand how women were, it took women so long to be included and um, people of color too. So, so maybe that's the new thing I would add if I could go back to my old, uh, and I'll talk specifically then like U.S. history. If I could go back to my old U.S. history syllabus, I think I would add that in. Also, the, the needle moved a lot further for women in athletics than in some other arenas. So I think that's a great idea to kind of overarch that theme into a lot of the spectrum. I'd pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it would be a really great, like in my history class, I teach thematically. And um, so that would be a neat one. And even it maybe more broad, because a lot of the themes are very broad. So you could do something like pop culture, you know, because sports is like such an important part of that pop culture. Well, so um, Kelsey and I actually met each other through our book club and we read lots of historical fiction. It's just like kind of the number one pick of the crew. Um, I think we have... 14 women in our book club and they're all rock stars in their own right and so everyone kind of brings historical fiction to the table because it's really fun to talk about but why did i'm so curious at least why you chose to write a book about historical fiction um, as a novel rather than historical um, or history was there a process in converting that history into a fiction scary or you know tell us a little bit about the process of kind of saying this is where i'm going to go with this Right. Well, so my primary interest has always been, even when I go back and look at what I, the work I did in college, in English and in history classes, it was always in um, women's history and like kind of overlooked women. And so to be honest, fiction works really well for women's history and overlooked women because to kind of our point earlier about women being erased from the historical record, there tends to be a lot of room for imagination when it comes to writing about women because there's just sort of a not a lot out there. Like my first novel, you know, is about the Alcott sisters as in Louisa May Alcott who wrote Little Women. She is one of the few women really in American history who is very well documented, like to the point of every day she kept a journal and like she, she, we know exactly where Louisa May Alcott was like most days of her entire life. Yet her sister May, her younger sister, really only is known through being Amy March. And yet she has this very interesting story of being a professional painter, um, like very successful artist in her own right. And yet she's been eclipsed by this more famous older sister. And so my point with that is like May, there wasn't a lot, like I couldn't go back and figure out every day where she was. So, I mean, I could do all this research and figure out what the lives of women artists were sort of like back then, but I really didn't have the, the, le the wealth of detail that we would on like many male figures or like the rare Louise May Alcott. And so and so, like, May is just an example, like many of these women who there's just not, or there are at least big gaps in the record of, like, what were they doing and how did they get here? And, and so, to me, like, historical fiction 
especially with my high school English teacher background, is like the perfect marriage of kind of entertainment, but also education. You know, like I felt like when I was teaching, I was most successful when my students were having fun and like not even thinking about the fact that they were learning something. And I think that historical fiction can do that really well. Like my best compliment I can get from a reader is like, oh my gosh, I learned so much, but I was having so much fun. I didn't even think about it. It was later I realized I was looking everyone up on the internet. And I'm like, that's that's exactly what I love to hear. Like that's when I feel like it's been a job well done. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. I had a short stint as an American literature teacher. I was not certified to do that. But anyway, <laughs> it was fun to be able to bring in historical fiction into, you know, and, and, and teach books that I've always wanted to have kids read in my history class. But we don't often have time to do like a novel that's not like the focus. Um, maybe we should. I don't know. Someone might critique me on that. But <laughs> you know, I taught a humanities class for a while, and it was a, it was called American Studies, and it was I managed to get my kids for two blocks every day, technically like in English and history, and we just kind of mixed them together, and that was one of the most successful years I've ever had because like we could read the jungle, and suddenly students were like obsessed about factory life and like how our foods changed over the years. And they were like reading Fast Food Nation on their own. And they're, you know, I could just see how like learning can make, you know, all these kids curious and want to learn more like on their own. And so I think that when students can have their imaginations engaged, be it through literature, through theater, through art, through all these different things, it really, I mean, our brains are wired for story, right? That's how we learn. And so I think that there's something really compelling there with trying to not just make history, and I know you guys don't do this, but just like the memorization of dates and places and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, we just need students to remember these great stories about how history unfolded. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's exactly it. As you walk away with those stories, I love that thought of like getting someone's curiosity engaged. So can you tell everyone a little bit about your book and the three unique and extraordinary women you've selected as the main characters? So, you know... I'll back it up even a little bit about how I found this story because really like that kind of, and it actually has to do with school. My younger daughter is a swimmer and she back in fourth grade had to do this biography project and she picked Gertrude Ederly. Now I had not ever heard of Gertrude Ederly. She was an American Olympian from 1924, a swimmer. She won three gold medals. And, you know, for most of us, that would be enough, three medals. But she decided, no, she was going to go ahead and swim the English Channel. And it took her two tries, but she did it. And she came home to the U.S., lauded as really a, an American hero. President Woodrow Wilson called her America's best girl, ticker tape parade in Manhattan, like the whole nine yards. She was a certifiable big deal. And yet here I was, and this was probably like 2018, I'd never, 17, I'd never heard of her. I played sports my whole life um, and taught history, like all these things. And I had never like heard anything about this woman. So that's sort of what got me going down this rabbit hole of women athletes. And really what I found were so many interesting stories. But I was became very interested in this time period that is when women... So the first modern Olympics happens in 1896. And Baron de Coubertin, who was like the founder of the modern Olympics, um, did not want women participating in it. He thought the only role for women was to just hand out medals to the male victors. Well, in 1900, a few women sort of agitated to to be involved, and they were allowed to participate in a handful of sports, and these were called aesthetically pleasing sports. And I'm sorry, we have to pot what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what we're talking about there is like tennis, eventually like archery, fencing, just a few. Oh, sailing. Like the first woman to win, win a gold medal was in sailing. She was in a crew with her husband. So, um, you know, just a few little sports. No one wanted anyone to get too crazy here. And like then, no one wanted anyone to look too masculine. <laughs> right. I mean, there was a very real fear by people. And this sounds so crazy to people in 2020, but your uterus could fall out if you were running too fast. <laughs> I can't watch out it. a beard or mustache if you train too hard. I mean, these were all things seriously that um, I feel like we need to tap our runners on the like, as your uterus ever. <laughs> I know. I mean, none of these things have ever happened to me. I don't know about you guys, but I mean, well, that was the with the Boston Marathon in like 1967 with Catherine Switzer. That was the 
Right. I mean, Title IX is passed in the in 72. So yeah, I mean, this belief went on for many, many decades. And it really isn't until the 70s that, um, you know, by law, like they had to kind of start letting women participate um, in these things. And so there is a, there is this woman named Alice Milliot who comes along in the late 19, you know, like 1918. And she starts demanding of the International Olympic Committee, like, you need to let women participate in a broader range of sports. And they denied her. And so, like, you know, a great tenacious d- woman does. She decided to hold her own women's only Olympics. And she was no dummy. She did it in Monte Carlo. So beautiful scenic place. And it was very popular. Like women came out several times for this event and it became, you know, very successful. And so eventually the IOC caved and allowed women on a provisional basis to race in track and field in 1928 for the first time. And that's where we meet Betty. Right. Yes. Okay. So this period where I'm kind of circling back to then is this period of 1928 to 1936 became very interesting to me. It's three Olympics, 28 in Amsterdam, 32 in Los Angeles, and 36 in Berlin. And then the Olympics are canceled several times because of World War II. So this brief period gives us a really kind of interesting view into especially into women's track and field in this time, because it's kind of a discrete period where like there's almost before 36 and then like after the World Wars. And and the Olympians are different for the most part, you know, everything sort of changes. And this whole idea then of these three Olympics where women were really fighting for basic participation here, um, that to me seemed like there was an interesting story there. And so I started digging around. And first, you know, there's Betty Robinson, who is this 16 year old schoolgirl outside of Chicago running for the train one day. And a teacher sees her and thinks she looks fast. She enters a few local races and no joke, five races later, she is in Amsterdam racing in the Olympics. Today, you train your whole life, right? Like, or at least for many, many years. And so, um, yet it doesn't take her long. And then that's just sort of the beginning. She comes back. She wants, you know, she's gets this huge success in Amsterdam. She wins a gold medal in the hundred. She wins a silver medal in the relay. She's already got her eyes on 32 and she's in this plane crash. I couldn't believe that when I read it. And and then I had to look it up. I was like, she's, she's making this up. Like this is the historical fiction part. And then I'm out here Googling it. I'm like, that really happened. Like she was in a plane crash. The craziest parts of this book are the truest. I can say that with full, like, I mean, yeah, she is in a plane crash and she's actually the left for dead. I mean, a guy just throws her into the back of his truck and drops her off at the morgue. And it's not till they see her chest moving, the undertaker, that he calls in doctors and they realize she has broken legs, a broken arm, all these problems. And they tell her, you know, you'll be lucky to ever walk again. Forget running. I was, Rachel, as I was reading this book, I kept thinking about you and all of your injuries that you've had. Well, Amber, too, you have been you have been in a bike. I witnessed your bike crash. Rachel was in a, a head on collision with a car where she was knocked unconscious. And I kept thinking about both of your journeys back to sport and Betty's, you know, was probably uh, thankfully scarier than both of yours. (laughs) But uh, but just holy moly, like it it was a really cool moment. And I mean, terrifying moment in your book. But I think it also speaks to like the mental toughness that athletes have to have in order to overcome obstacles. Like you guys having the injuries that you've had, Amber and Rachel, and like there's another level mentally that you have to be able to go to in order to compete at that level. Like there's people with talent, but if they don't have that mental capacity, then it's like, it's never gonna, like that could have knocked somebody out. Right, no, I mean, I really believe that Betty's story is like the most amazing comeback in kind of sports history, certainly Olympic history that we've never heard of. I mean, how is it that we've never heard of that? And so like that kind of just blew me away. And so, and then, so what I became interested in was, I mean, Betty's story alone clearly is, It could be a book, but I really did want to show kind of the broad range of, of paths into the Olympics because, you know, Betty's kind of like this golden girl until she has this accident. And then she kind of has to come clawing her way from the top. Well, then I wanted someone who really was a nobody and maybe even more than a nobody, but an outcast until they kind of find their success through the Olympics. And that was Helen Stevens. And then race is a whole other interesting aspect to this time period.
Right. So, I mean, that's a really underreported story of the 1936 games. Jesse Owens is a huge story. He won four gold medals. He was the news. But really, out of those 359 athletes, the American athletes who went to Berlin, there were eight black athletes, 18 black athletes. Those 18 athletes won 25% of the medals from those games. So clearly, like, incredible. <laughs> and yet, Jesse Owens is the only one you can pull out of, you know, the top of your head, right? And so that's partly because white newspaper reporters knew they couldn't not report on Jesse Owens. He was too big a story. But none of them wanted to report on all these other guys. So these men, and they were mostly men at that point, these, you know, Louise and Tidy are there, these two black women. But but um, all of these men come home, they're collegiate racers and everything. They're not allowed to race in certain races in this country themselves. I mean, we think of them as having to prove themselves to Hitler and sort of disprove his theories. But they were also needing to prove themselves to their own countrymen. Because like Jesse Owens comes home from Berlin with his four gold medals, and he still can't live on campus at Ohio State. You know, I mean, the, the barriers to all of these athletes was just amazing. And so that, you know, I'm always asked sort of what I learned that surprised me. I mean, the story of contributions of black athletes to these 36 Olympics is very significant. And I feel like more attention needs to be paid to that too. I mean, that's a part of my story. And Louise Stokes is kind of the Olympian, I feel like, who's sort of been largely erased from history. And I think she has such an interesting story and we can learn so much. She paves the way clearly for so many other women to come. And so that's why that period of 28 to 36 interested me. And just, I really, I mean, none of these women are household names at all. And I really felt like, um, well, yes, we've come a long way. And it sounds like we'll talk about that in a bit. We also have not at all. And, and so those three give us sort of an interesting look into that. Yeah, I liked the dichotomy of all of them and the different backgrounds they were all coming from, different parts of the country. So different upbringing at that time period, which would be significantly different than it would be today. So I loved that they were all very different American stories, which was kind of cool, too. There were women that you did include in your book, but they weren't your main characters. Um, Babe Dedrickson comes to mind. Um, I mean, t we mentioned Tidy. She's in your book. She is clearly one of the big characters, but she's not. We don't hear this the story from her perspective at all. And um, so I was curious, like Babe in particular. Well, so Tidy uh, actually gets to race in 36 and Babe Dedrickson is breaking all sorts of records in 32. So I'm just curious why, um, why not those two women? Right. So, well, Tiny does play a big role in the book. I felt like Louise provides such an interesting contrast in that essentially she is denied racing both times. So, so while Tidy does get to race in 36, the fact that Louise doesn't, to me, made her the clear, like she was obviously going to be a voice in this book. Um, as for Babe, you know, the thing that unifies the women in Fast Girls is that they all come together to race in these Hitler games, right, in Berlin in 1936. And Babe doesn't. She goes pro before that. So right then and there, she in my mind, was disqualified from this book. There were a number of reasons. Like, she just wasn't as compelling a figure to me as these other. I loved her as a, as a secondary figure because she's pretty controversial. I mean, people often read my book and they're kind of surprised by the way she is depicted. But I can tell you right now, all of those stories, all of the things she does in the book are, are based in things that actually are reported in oral histories and, you know, books and newspaper stories. She was very self-promotional. She was kind of an island and she did not want to, she had no interest in forming a sisterhood with any of her fellow teammates. She was all out there for Babe Dedrickson. They really had to kind of be selfish in that way. Like there wasn't room for two at the top. Right. There are a lot of reasons. Yeah. I think, I mean, I can understand why they did that, but, but so to me, she just wasn't someone who spoke to me enough. She wasn't in that 36 Olympics that she made it into the final cut. All right, well, this is a great moment to pause. So we're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, visit our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Remedial Herstory. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. 
Patreon allows you to sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to bonus materials, extended episodes, insider information, and gear. Patrons who give at the $10 tier will receive a remedial history sticker. We want to sincerely thank some of our patrons for their contributions. Kent and Jamie Heckel from Ohio have been some of our biggest fans from the beginning. Thank you so much for your contribution. And a huge thank you to Bridget Erlinson from Connecticut. As an educator, your endorsement and passion for equitable education means a great deal. Thank you for your support and endorsement. You can find a link to our Patreon page on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Or you can go to patreon.com and search for Remedial Herstory. Welcome back, everyone. Elise, in the beginning of your book, you have a historical note where you explain how primary sources that you've included in the t- in the book, and there are, you know, every few chapters you have these prim- these newspaper articles that are included. Um, they are mostly paraphrased by you, and of course, the historian in me is like, "How accurate is this?" You know, I I, I need to I wanted to know that, um, and I know you you sort of said that it it's pretty accurate. Um, but as I was reading, I was also really surprised that there were so many newspaper clippings. I was surprised that these women were getting attention in the news. So um, there's sort of a two part question there: How accurate is it? And and are, you know, were these were people really writing about these women and why therefore didn't we hear about them right well yes okay so the newspaper articles are completely my own creation i wrote them all and i kind of liken them to you know i read hundreds maybe even thousands of these old vintage newspapers trying to better understand sort of what was happening and attitudes of the time and i mean i read all of those so you don't have to like i picked the choice language i mean i really was struck by how these reporters talked about these women, like the buxom gal in lane three and the cat fights and all of this kind of crazy stuff that I really felt like capturing that for readers felt important to me. And so writing those newspaper articles was both one of the most fun aspects to this book and also the most frustrating because, you know, each of those articles, for the most part, gets at something very annoying that's happening in society. I was really thinking a lot about the Olympics in Rio in 2016 while I was writing those, because that was an Olympics I felt like where there was a national conversation about how we talk about women athletes in the press. And like, maybe a woman would win an event and the camera would immediately pan to her husband, who was also her coach, and start talking about that versus the actual woman who had won the you know the event. Um, And so there were all kinds of, you know, I I still play, I'm an avid tennis player. And the fact that we're still talking about Serena Williams having had a baby. And I mean, I'm so over this topic. Like, and as for women um, being written about in the press, I mean, keep in mind, (laughs) you know, they're like a couple of, you know, I mean, women were written about, I should also add their names are spelled differently in like every article and the details are often wrong. Like the accounts vary so widely. Um, but you know, a lot of those were pretty local newspapers I was working with. So, I mean, reporters covered everything. One event I learned about that women used to compete in was rolling pin throwing. Like Mrs. Hooper came in third over the weekend. For our audience, they can't see Kelsey and I's faces. They're just like, what? <laughs> to be fair, I, after reading that, was interested in how hard is it to throw a rolling pin. And I went out and threw one. Mine. No. And I did not get anywhere near the distance these women in the articles were throwing. Oh, so clearly, like, yeah, there is something there. Um, but I guess my point with that is like, Okay, yeah, they were reporting on these, but like Jesse Owens is front page news on the New York Times. Betty Robinson is in section D in a small, more local paper in Illinois. You know, I mean, Helen Stevens got some national headlines because again, she had a story that was sort of too big to be missed. But for the most part, these women, it was sort of smaller potatoes reporting we're talking about. (laughs) That's still happening in today's times. Like I think about the women's soccer team articles you read. Sometimes it's like, you would never say some of these things about a man, nor do you in the men's you know, U.S. team. So it's just really interesting that you point that out and you bring it to light that it was it was happening then and really highlighted. But then, you know, it's sad that it's still, you know, happening today. Rachel and Amber, I wanted to bring you in here. Like, 
have you ever had like some of the things you know people are are likening these women to like fighting like you know like a cat fight and um the you know like what you mentioned with serena williams have either of you had press like that in your experience you mean with like a negative connotation yeah just kind of like a sexist kind of luckily i don't think so (laughs) this might be like a little bit of a tangent but i think it's important to just bring up here and it's you know, I won't name them, but there's like some huge organizations out there that like a, a female athlete will sign a contract. And then when she gets pregnant, the contract is null and void. Right. And, you know, and it's like, there's so many females. I mean, there's a ton of females, you know, this Rachel, like in triathlon that have come back stronger than ever after having the baby. And it's like, it kills me when like some of them are like, Oh, I'm so thankful that my sponsor stuck by me through the pregnancy. I'm like, what? is that what is that even why would you even put that in the universe like it's like it doesn't make sense right it's like don't be thanks. apologizing for having yeah. a baby. i think yeah. so yeah so when i i got dropped from my um from one of my sponsors and then this was back in 2016 and then i got offered as a position on a team shortly after that and the, the new position on the team was going to be awesome Right after I got offered the position on the team, I found out I was pregnant. I didn't tell them I was pregnant and then they took away the offer, but I felt the pressure to say, I'm not going to accept this offer because I'm, I know that I'm not going to be racing next year. But it's kind of, but so in my mind, you know, it's like, we have to move away from that mindset because mindset yeah. because you, you still have things to offer, right? You still have things to offer. And it's, I mean, you're still training, you're still out there on social media. It's like, you're not... <laughs> No, for sure. Dead. You didn't die. Yeah. You don't have to go lock yourself in a, a house in olden time. Pregnant female athlete would be so motivating for people, right? It's like, yes, you actually can still run when and bike and swim when you're pregnant, right? It's not. I think about like Mia Hamm having twins and coming back and crushing it in soccer. Yeah. Yeah. And her teammates, she stood on the sidelines during most of her games and most of her seasons as a pregnant team member. And that was like it's very inspiring that she can lead and be the captain of the team. No, I think, I don't think I made the right decision there. I think I should have maybe fought harder for it. No, but, yeah, but, it, it's, no, it's, but it's sad too. It, I mean, it's just sad too, right. That you just felt bad. Like you felt compelled that you needed to give it up. It's like, why do we have, why is that seed in our brain? Right? It's the same thing when women accept jobs in general, not even just athletes, you know, yep. if a woman comes in and she's pregnant, she feels obligated to tell. And so like, actually by law, you don't have to. Well, I think all of this gets to something that Elise, I think you do really well in your book, which is including these real events that happen to these women and highlighting the double standard of male athletes and female athletes. Um, and I have a list here and I'm just hoping that you could talk about a couple of these Um one of the things that stood out to me is um, some of the girls win the AAU championship and go to uh, for the relay and they go to celebrate at a bar and they have to have a chaperone, a male chaperone to go into a, to enter a bar. Um, and, you know, her husband has to be like, yes, these women are with me. Like I, I you know, I account for them or whatever. Um Eleanor Holm um, being dismissed from the Olympic team for drunkenness on her way to um, the Olympics in 36. And um, I read online that um, she said later that the the man in charge um, who dismissed her had actually like come on to her and she had rejected him. And so that was like a piece of the story, too. Um uh, Helen is uh, this. I don't know if this gives too much away from your book, but she's sexually propositioned by Hitler after she wins gold. And that, like, blew my mind. <laughs> I so need so- to kind of like dig into this. That's an accurate that happened. Yeah, that stuff still happens. I had a friend of mine win an ultra marathon and without giving too much of like there, there was some like stuff with the race director coming on to her and then um, causing problems for her later. And this was like a few years ago. Um, and then of course the, the classic, all the women who are crushing it at life being called men. And, um, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't possibly be doing this as women. So therefore they're manly. And Helen is accused of being a man and she has to go in front of physicians to prove that she's a woman. Um, 
And I, yeah, just so many, there are so many layers there of double standards and things that would never, ever, ever happen to male athletes. And feel free to take any one of those. But I, I thought, wow, like we've got to talk about this and what your thoughts were as you were writing those. And they're all true. So, I mean, I, I don't even know where to start. Right. Um, the scene with the bar is not, I don't have, I don't know of any account of them going to a bar, but it is an interesting historical detail from the time. Like women could go to bars um there was just this heavy emphasis during this time period on women needing chaperones so this is another detail that kind of runs throughout the book the women's teens always have a chaperone the men never have chaperones so if we want to sort of bump it to eleanor the, the eleanor home home debacle i mean yeah she's drinking champagne she's having a good old time she's married i mean she had won before like she felt like living her best life at the Olympics. <laughs> all by the way, I mean like the smoking, the drinking, that also was happening. Training is not what it is like for Amber and Rachel. Like today, things were a lot more loosey goosey. Yeah, Betty smoked cigarettes through like most of the book. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. Who does that? Amber, are you a, a serious <laughs> smoker before you raise the state? I mean, sure. I have been drinking a lot of IPA, but that's yeah. different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was happening everywhere. And so yeah, I mean Eleanor is kicked off the team as sort of one of the like prospect for winning too by the way um she's thrown off she does get a little bit of the last laugh where she gets to be she ends up being a reporter the scene at the party where she kind of encounters Avery Brundage again I I did fictionalize that yeah that there are just so many cases of double standards happening here and you know even like actually just referencing that party that wasn't in your list but that party is a real party but what happens there at that party that's all true too like I mean to me actually that like just spoke so much of me too and Harvey Weinstein, all the heart stuff of Harvey Weinstein. I mean, you know, welcoming women into your room wearing only a robe. And, you know, the stuff that we haven't even talked about also is like the Stella Walsh storyline and how it does turn out that she ends up, we now know, was an intersex athlete. The Olympics still haven't figured out what to do about that. They still, their, their sort of policy on that is always shifting. Um, but I think... I think it must have been so stressful on a lot of these women of feeling like if they weren't necessarily like a cis white gendered woman, there was a lot of fear of like being found out of, of being discovered and um, potentially, you know, having everything taken away from you. I mean, there was a movement to remove all the records, everything Stella had won over the decades from her once it was found out that she had been intersex. The story of Hitler and Helen is insane, where he propositions her and then propositions her coach. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I had never heard that. And there was the photo of them together. And then, you know, I read in her handwritten diary, I went to Missouri, was able to visit her private collection. And, you know, she writes about her encounter with Hitler. Her um, biographer helped me out with the book and she, yeah, she described all of that happening. And there was so, this book, more than I think any of the others I've done, just that there was such a level of adventure of reading about these women's lives that I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe this whole line of history I knew nothing about. So how do you feel when you look at their stories? I mean, I feel tremendously inspired. I think there's so much to be learned from these women. And I, I hope readers come away from the book also just feeling excited by the possibilities and, and kind of raring to go on the on closing the gaps that we still have. I mean, just for example, there still aren't an equal number of Olympic events open to women that there are to men. Um, so, I mean, there's like, there's still room on the executive, you know, the Olympic committee for more women leadership. They still haven't hit their goal of having more women leaders on there. So there's still progress to be made. Yeah. Well, and that's a great segue actually to bringing Rachel and Amber into this conversation. Um, there's so much that has, has happened since 36. We mentioned title nine already. Um, I'm thinking about Bobby Gibb who jumped into the Boston marathon and really challenged this idea that, um, women can, can't go, you know, a certain distance, you know, at some point they'll, they'll max out. They're not capable of doing what men can do. And, um, in fact, history has shown the opposite opposite. Um, we mentioned all sorts of women who have come back from having children. Um, and, you know, um, Serena Williams, Mia Hamm, Carly Lloyd, Marinda Carfrey. Um, so I think, um, 
and, and then, of course, you have growing viewership of women in sport. And um, I think about the women's soccer team, like maxing out um, and, and hitting, uh, setting records with the number of viewers that, that watched their their Olympic Games. Um, so a lot of issues, though, still remain. So um, we want to turn to to our other guests here. Amber, a few years ago, you wrote a letter, an open letter to Iron Man about um, their sexist policy on how many um, people, how many women they were allowing to compete at the world championship. And you are one of many women, um, female pros who wrote an open letter. Would you mind telling everybody about that experience being a pro and not having a similar shot to compete at worlds like men were able to? Well, you know, I think like what sort of like is the most heartbreaking, like part of the story is, you know, writing the letter and sort of fighting for what like I believed was right. I I actually felt bad about it. I was like, oh man, you know, is this right? Like <laughs> they make you feel bad about it, you know? Um, and I mean, it, it is silly. It, it's like, it's, it's something that should have just been, I mean, I think what, Rachel, when did they pass the 50, 50? Was it 2019? It was very, very recent. Yeah. Well, could you explain what you mean by 50, 50? So, um, there's at the world championships, 50 guys qualified for the world. 50 pro guys would qualify and 30, what is it? 35. 35, 35 females got qualifying spots. And, the whole, their reason was the female field is not as deep. The female field, you know, is not as strong. And then, which actually wasn't true. Like, no, the, not, the, yeah. actually not true at all. Like the they talent, had the same depth of field. So women were having to earn more points to get their spot than the men were. And to earn more points, you have to race more. And the year that you wrote this letter, Amber, how many Ironman did you do? So in order to qualify 13 at the end of that year i was seventh at ironman florida and then i was and then 2014 in april i was third at ironman texas and then i won ironman lake placid and i was like the first non-qualifier i was like 30th on the list i remember that i remember you barely made it and i was like how well, is that no, no i didn't i didn't make it i was the first non-qualifier oh first not oh, okay i was the first oh, non-qualifier gosh. and so and it just infuriated me so now i'm having to race Montremblant two that weeks later and that's where i got second so i had raced like five ironmen before i got to kona and you know and so then i and then i got to the world championships and i was just destroyed and like going back and forth the ceo ceo too he was like well you know the field's not as deep not as strong there's not enough room on the pier at kona and then there's all these like, pictures of all the empty God, space. that's the worst <laughs> excuse I've ever heard. There's all these pictures, like, though, of all the empty space on oh the pier my after God. that. I was like, this is what it's come down to. There's not enough room on the pier. That's like a guy fumbling and just seeing like, um, and it's purple and it's, um, there's just too many green things. And, um, I gotta go. Someone's <laughs> calling my name. But it, but it was. Doing? It was, it really was it. Like, I think like the, my lasting impression was like, they, they made me feel bad about asking for what I knew was right. Right. And I hate that feeling. Good for you for standing up for the other women around you and writing that letter. So what was the result of that letter? Was that, is this new rule because of that letter? So because of a bu- because of a bunch of letters um, okay. and filled with pressure, but the sad thing in his sport too is the you know in regards to pro contracts, the guys still you know still take seventy percent of the money. When the tele when they televise Kona the World Championships, it's like they show nine they show the guys ninety percent of the time. Um, I mean, and we're I would say we're like I hate to use this word that we're a little bit. I'm not going to use it. We're more forward in triathlon. Cycling is still, they have unequal pay for girls and females, and they have unequal spots to world championships. It's it's sad that triathlon is kind of like better. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, still it's sad not, that Ironman yeah. is exactly on the forefront because they do a lot of things wrong. Yeah. So. <laughs> so wait, so I... Rachel, recently, this year, you wrote a U.S. Um, AT, the governing body of the U.S. triathlon, and asked them to change their maternity policy. So you alluded to this earlier. Um, can you tell everyone a little bit about 
kind of going through that process and a little bit more of why you kind of started to make that endeavor? Yeah. So uh, as a pro, you have your license for three years before you have to requalify. And I had a, a little bit of a unique situation in that I had in that three years, I had two pregnancies. I was always trying, like when we were thinking about having a family and, and, and then uh, with me racing, I kept, we kept putting off having a family because we were always trying to time it right with racing. I always wanted to have that great season. I kept getting injured. That great season was really elusive. Um, and then we finally had our family, had it all planned out. I was going to come back and race really strong in 2019. And, and then our son happened. Um, so it made me think a lot about how women in our sport or women in sport in general are having to plan their families around sport um, rather than making sport work with their families. So I wanted to, like, I, I talked to USAT about if they would do an extension. I was told they wouldn't. Later on, I was told that I would, I should have gone to like special consideration, but um, I wrote USAT a letter about what it's like to come back from pregnancy, um, sort of problems with injuries for the year after you're pregnant and breastfeeding. And uh, I got a response immediately, which was really um, heartening based on all this <laughs> crappy stuff we always hear about with <laughs> not paying attention to women's issues. And, uh, and they decided to give an 18 month extension for tra for pregnant triathletes, depending on the circumstance. That's incredible. Okay. How do you feel after kind of like helping make that happen? I don't, I don't feel like I did that much. I wrote an email, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but like you, voiced, you voiced it for the next woman. Like you set, you set the, the stage for someone else to be successful. I, I, yeah, I, I look at the girls that I coach and I think about how I want them to like be able to do both. I want them, they all, they talk to me all the time about how they love my kids and how they want to have kids when they grow up and like, hold on, you're like 13, but, um, <laughs> put the Even if you <laughs> um, but I want them to be able to do both and I don't want them to have to feel like they have to choose. I'm a big believer that even though we can do it all, we don't necessarily have to, but we yeah. still should be able to, if we want to, you know yeah. what I mean? Given, yeah. Given the right opportunities. Right. Exactly. Love that. That's a good ending point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you all so much. Elise, is there any, I want to give you an opportunity, last word, any last things you wanted to share with us about your book? No, you know, I mean, I just love, I, I honestly, I love listening to Rachel and Amber and kind of hearing the, you know, the direct line, I really feel like over time, because these women are going to be changing just like these women in the twenties and thirties change things. I mean, this group will be doing the same thing. And so while that email may not feel significant, I mean, I think it obviously is. And so I think that's exciting. I mean, again, I just, I hope people see the potential of what could be. That's always why I'm doing these things. And, and clearly these two exemplify that. Well, thank you so much for writing your book and bringing these women to life for us to read. Rachel, Amber, we have copies coming to you so that you can be enlightened about the women who trailblazed <laughs> <laughs> to make the path for you guys. For the teachers out there, fitting women's sports history as well as like any sports history into the typical like military political history that we are all sort of governed by is really challenging. So I've taken two approaches to helping get these women's stories into your classrooms. Uh, first, I made a list of female athletes who broke barriers and are really significant in history that you could turn into student projects at any level. So that that could be elementary to, to 12th grade. And I'm a huge, a huge proponent of project-based learning because that's a really great way to get individual stories out there for kids to know. Um, the second thing that I've done is in order to get these stories into sort of the political um, and, and military curriculum that we have, um, I've created a lesson plan where we take the interaction between Helen and Hitler, where she is sexually propositioned by him, and we fit that into the larger narrative in Nazi Germany uh, that is really, really belittling, condemning, patronizing, and ultimately leads to women being ostracized into the domestic sphere in the 20th century. 
So the list and the lesson plan are available on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Check it out. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for everything that you've contributed this evening and really bringing some great stories to life. And so thank you, Elise, for spending some time with us. Um, And Amber and Rachel, go kick some butt on the road. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.